kind of going to get to the cusp of my talk here. I got to tell you about this person I know, Yeshua Ben Yesu. He was an old shaman back a couple thousand years ago. And this guy, he figured it out. He went for a while. I mean, in fact, historical records, they don't know what he was doing for most of his life. And he came back around the time he was, uh, I, mean, I think he was like 30. He came back when he was 30 and he started teaching people. And he started teaching people the knowledge of this substance. It was funny because his first name, well, his, his name when he was born was Yeshua Ben Yesu. But later in his life, he took up the name Christos, which uh, in his language, Aramaic, had its root in the Babylonian language, uh, uh, the Sumerian, uh, uh, Babylonian type languages. And the word Christos quite literally means the smeared or anointed one. And what was he smearing or anointing with? Well, he was smearing and anointing with a blend of drugs, the first of which included cannabis. In fact, I don't know if you've figured it out yet, but Christos means Christ. And that's kind of the cusp of the words that we use with our life. That when we look at what a word actually means, we come to a better understanding of what it is. And so knowing the Christos means Christ, that leads us to some pretty interesting revelations about the life of that man. Let's look at the miracles of Jesus real quick. He, uh, would heal the blind. If you had cannabis oil and you rubbed it on somebody's eyes, a salve on somebody's eyes that had glaucoma, they could see and they wouldn't lose their sight. Um, he, healed, he healed the deaf. Well, in, ancient, in the ancient Chinese medical cornucopia, one of the uses for cannabis was to remove earwicks and bugs that had burrowed inside people's ear canals. And so it was a way to make people hear again. He, let's see, he cured the lepers. This is one of my personal favorite ones. It was found out in the 1990s, and actually a researcher in the 1960s in Russia found this out as well, that cannabis cures MSRA staph infections. It's one of the only things known to cure staph infections. Not only staph infections, but things like herpes. In 1990, the University of Florida found out that the cannabinoids in cannabis could kill the herpes virus. So. So we've got the blind, we've taken care of the deaf. Oh yeah, what I was gonna say with that, the MRSA staph infections. A lot of time in biblical times, anybody that had a very bad skin disease, such as uh, psoriasis or plotis, plotis, I can't pronounce that word just yet, but very bad skin lesions. Well, with the antiseptic, antifungal properties in the cannabis, oftentimes when you would rub that on those lesions, those people would heal. And so we've got the healing of the lepers, healing of the lepers taken care of, the blind, the hearing, oh, the lame people, the lame could walk. Well, the topical application of cannabis on any joint would relieve almost anyone with arthritis, with, with several disabilitating issues with their skin, with their, with their entire body. In fact, it's found that this is the most useful medicine known to man that, that quite literally, let's look at what we're using for medicine now. I mean, the DuPont family put us on this petrochemical trip. Let's, uh, let's talk about medicines real quick. What medicines are we using now? Well, Ritalin is the number one prescribed drug to children. And uh, that might not mean anything except for the fact that it's methamphetamate. It's one molecule different from methamphetamine. But I'm sure there's a good reason the chemical corporations like Bayer would want us to, you know, use that and put it, what? Excuse me, oh, I, I just got word that Bayer was one of the companies that helped build the concentration camp in order to start testing on people. Oh, and Ritalin and Speed, those were Nazi inventions. The funny thing about Speed is this, like just the Ritalin, what happens when you take a six-year-old child and give him methamphetamine for 10, 12 years of his life and then cut him off when he's 16 or 17? What do you think is going to happen there? I've got a hypothesis. I bet that if you build an addiction in someone that strong for that long, then as soon as you cut them off, they're going to go look for it. And this is kind of the interesting thing about the drug laws the way we have them now is that 
somebody that can't afford it, somebody that doesn't have medical insurance, can't go get it. So they'll go make it, they'll go get arrested, they'll end up in prison, they'll make it with horrible chemicals that are hurting their bodies even worse than the original things. But, oh, if we have money, if we have the ability to buy our drugs, if we have the ability to go to a doctor, they'll prescribe you speed all day long. There are so many people in this village right now that are on diet pills. And I, I talked to them, I was like, they put you on speed. Oh, but my doctor prescribed it. It was like, the problem wasn't that they were on speed. It was like, they just wanted to be absolved of the responsibility of having to take account for their actions and they're all high on speed all the time. Oh, I'm not high on speed, my doctor gave it to me. And that's, you know, doctors have access to all these drugs, morphine, codeine. I mean, shoot, I've been given codeine. I was given codeine for so long until I found out what codeine was. You know what codeine is? I thought it came from, from as an opiate. Turns out, codeine hasn't been made from a plant since 1972. In fact, it's synthesized from coal tar and petroleum. It's like synthesized from coal tar and petroleum. Hey, 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 could somebody take a look back at that Hippocratic Oath? Because I think it said something about administering dangerous drugs to people and the first line of defense being that you make sure the person's diet is all right. And so rather than making sure my diet has, you know, omega-3s and omega-6s, I'm supposed to eat petroleum pills? I'm, I'm supposed to drink gas and eat coal? Is that, is that what I'm expected to do here? Because I'm not going to. I'm done. I'm done with that. There, hey, there are some things I love about Western medicine. There's a lot of really good things in there. But when you have pharmaceutical companies that are making $600 billion, billion with a B, billion dollars of profit a year, and they got a racket. It's, it's a racket. It's a scam. Hey, hey, how are we going to get the profits up, Vinny? Hey, I don't know. Why don't we make everything else illegal? Hey, that's a brilliant idea. And that's what happened. That's what they did. That's what the whole petroleum scam was. The DuPont family, all these petroleum men, these chemical companies got together and said, hey, got an idea. I'm going to convince, we're going to convince the entire world to stop getting their food, their clothing, their medicine, and their fuel from the surface of the earth where the sunshine rains down from heaven. And we're going to convince them to get their food, their clothing, their medicine, and their fuel from deep in a dark realm where no light may penetrate. And we'll pull this darkness up and we'll put it in little pills. We'll pull this darkness up and we'll pour it all over the land and we will make the world addicted to our black gold, our, our money source. And that's really what it was. It was literally a few people, a well-organized plan devised to bend the world over an oil barrel. I mean, it's a lie. It's an industrial strength lie, but a lie nonetheless. And the reason we know it's a lie is because we have thousands of years of empirical data. We know the truth of the meaning of words, that we've discovered the great mysteries of the reality, the plants, and the chemicals around us. And so, it kind of leads me to, I guess I'll just end with this, the knowledge of good and evil. At the beginning of that book, uh, we talk about the tree of life and the knowledge of good and evil. Can I, can I tell you what the knowledge of good and evil is? Okay. The knowledge of good and evil is this. represented by an apple tree, right? The apple's a perfect example. In fact, you could use any example, but the apple works fine. So you've got an apple. What's an apple? Well, in one form of the apple, I can give it to somebody as tasty, tasty food, or I can use the seeds to make arsenic and kill someone. So in one example of this use, we have a very positive or good application of the apple. And on the other example, we have a very bad application of the apple. Now, with this knowledge, we come to the ultimate conclusion.